Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. So guys, let us solve the GATE 2010 questions of uh, manufacturing processes. So first question is, which of the following is not a solid state welding process? So which is not a solid state welding process? Okay. So see here, first is friction stir welding. So this friction stir welding happens in the solid state. What happens? The two materials are joined together with the help of friction. One rotates at a very high RPM so that creates heat and basically with the help of diffusion there yeah, the welding takes place. So this is a solid one. <coughs> Next ultrasonic. So it is similar to that in the ultrasonic cases. So it's like a pulse movement. Okay, so the welding happens through that. So this is also a solid state welding. Next is explosive welding. So explosive that means we use some kind of explosive to get a very high strain rate because to get high strain rate we also generate some amount of heat so that leads to welding. So this is also solid one. But this flux code arc welding. So arc welding itself says that there will be some melting over there. So this is a liquid one. Okay. So, the, which is not one, so D will be the correct, right? Next. During metal casting of a slab, the thickness of solid formed after T is proportional to. So, it is asking for this casting, right? <clears throat> so, what is the law that we use in the case of casting? It is Sorino rule, right? So, that says that your time is proportional that is equal to k times of volume by area to whole square right so that means t will be directly proportional to v by a we can write like a length right so length square because volume divided by area so that will be left with some length right so here it is asking that <coughs> uh, the thickness so thickness is also one kind of length right so length will be proportional to t to power half because we need to reverse this. So that's why the option will be option B. The correct answer will be option B. Next. Which of the following is a suitable method to remove hydrogen from molten aluminum? Now suppose there is a molten aluminum, right? So that contains hydrogen. So this hydrogen will be in the dissolved forms in like a nascent hydrogen, right? So we need to remove this. So how we can remove this? See, the first option is expose, exposing uh, flowing melt to vacuum. Next, let us see bubble humidified argon gas through the melt. Then increase melt temperature or cover melt surface with a flux. So see here, like suppose we have this liquid aluminum, <coughs> right? So what happens this hydrogen, nascent hydrogen which is present. So this is like a, uh, it needs some surface on which the reaction of H and H should happen, right. So when it happens, so it happens when we put some amount of gas over there. So the gas which we put, it can be argon gas or sometimes nitrogen gas is also used, okay. So when we put this nitrogen gas from the bottom, so what happens? This nitrogen when flows above, so that creates a surface where this H and H reacts to form this H2 and gets out. So the correct answer will be option B. Option A, uh, exposing uh, exposed flowing melt to vacuum will not be the correct one. The correct method here is the argon gas because you might get confused with option A right <coughs> next which of the following are not commercially manufactured by powder metallurgy not commercially manufactured that means if there are certain things that can be manufactured using this powder metallurgy but that may not be commercially viable right so that's why like here it is written aircraft brake pads so these pads are basically made by this powder metallurgy okay this is powder metallurgy. Self lubricating bearings are also made by this powder metallurgy. We know 
then tungsten carbide based cutting tool this is also made by powder metallurgy but the only thing that is that turbine blade are not made by powder metallurgy because it is used at very high temperature <coughs> so this is basically single crystal nickel so that is made by the solidification method right okay so remember that. i think this question has been discussed in the physical metallurgy part also but the correct uh, thing is that it should be categorized under manufacturing process okay see next <coughs> these are two marks question match the defects given in group 1 with the suitable non destructive evolution technique from group 2 okay so cracks in a flat aluminum slab first crack in a flat aluminum slab so here it has told that there is a crack okay next sub surface porosity in a bronze casting sub surface it is talking then surface cracks in a steel tool internal porosity in a ceramic block see the options are like radiography so radiography we know it can detect the internal one right eddy current we know the surface one it can also detect and sub surface also it can detect next it is ultrasonic so ultrasonic does for the internal one magnetic particle so it does for surface as well as sub surface right and what is the difference between eddy current and magnetic magnetic particle is used for magnetic material right so see so these tricks will help you to answer this one see crack in a flat aluminum slab so this is a aluminum slab right so aluminum is not a magnetic material okay so <clears throat> we can use right now anything so just hold on over here so let us see the other option sub surface porosity in a bronze casting so it is talking for sub surface right so sub surface it can be your magnetic this or eddy current this right but here it is bronze casting that means it is non magnetic so non magnetic we can use using this eddy current one right next surface cracks in a steel tool right surface cracks in a steel tool steel is a magnetic so we need to find for the surface one so it will match with option 4 right next internal porosity in a ceramic block this is for internal one right so internal one we can do using this radiography right so that's why it will match with this radiography next cracks in a flat aluminum slab okay so this aluminum slab can be done with the left over option that is 3 right <coughs> so the correct answer it will be p will match with 3 q will match with 2 r will match with 4 and s will match with 1 okay so it is option d right next the maximum possible reduction in a single pass for cold rolling of a 200 mm slab is 200 mm slab is given the coefficient of friction is 0.1 and roll diameter is 400 mm okay so we have the roll diameter that is 400 mm and we are putting a slab the roll diameter is 400 mm right so what is the formula for this there is a simple formula that is delta h max is equal to mu square r right so mu square r is the maximum possible reduction so basically this mass maximum possible reduction depends on the size of the roll and the friction coefficient not on the thickness of the slab okay so whatever be the thickness okay so basically it will decide what is the amount of reduction we can give but the thickness has roll like it should be under the angle of bite right where we want to put it okay so this delta h max will be mu square r so r here we can take as 200 right because diameter is 400 so r will be 200 so this delta h max equal to mu mu is 0.1 so 0.1 whole square into 200 so 0.01 into 200 so 
it will be 2 mm. So the maximum reduction here it can be 2 mm, right? So we'll mark here 2 mm. Next, hmm. match the requirement from group one with the suitable casting processes from group two. Okay. See, good surface finish first, expandable mold, heavy casting, hollow, ornamental casting. Like slush casting, we have in the group two pressure die casting, investment casting, sand casting, right? So <clears throat> we will just mark which we uh, right now clear. Then we will proceed for the next. So we know the slush casting. So slush casting is uh, used to make some hollow ornaments, right? You must have seen the streets also. Some vendors come and they just pour it. You know, there is a structure like mold we have. Uh, they just pour it and quickly what happened they just pour it back means they just revert it so that the leftover molten material gets back and we get a very thin layer of the thing like the uh, idol you know so these are used for hollow ornamental casting so s will match with one so this is clear next it is like heavy castings so heavy castings, very big, big castings can only be made by this sand casting, okay. Expendable mold, expendable mold, basically the mold which is gets consumed, okay. So basically it is used in investment casting. Next, good surface finish. So we know that pressure die casting gives good surface finish, okay. It gives better surface finish as compared to the sand casting. Okay, sand casting doesn't have very good surface finish. Okay, so this P two and Q three, P two, Q three, R four. So option A. Next, <coughs> the tensile test of a sheet material exhibits twenty percent elongation in length and ten percent decrease in width. The plastic strain ratio is so this is a good question so basically this plastic strain ratio tells you about the ability of the plate or the sheet to resist you know to resist the changes like decrease in the thickness or the width right so it defines the ratio certain ratio if the, if ratio is more or less that defines its property okay so now suppose you are doing a tensile test of a sheet so what is the specimen? So during this tensile test, if you see the specimen, okay, so it somewhat looks like this, the cache of sheet and it has got some thickness, right? So this thickness, if you take it as T, so in the middle portion, now suppose we take it as this, as the gauge length, that is the L naught. So using this tensile test, what happens? This L naught will increase, and this W naught, which is the initial one, so that will decrease, and this T naught will also decrease, right? So this plastic strain ratio, that is the plastic strain ratio, is equal to L n. <coughs> the width strain, basically, it is defined as width strain divided by this uh, thickness strain so the strain that is the and this strain is calculated as the true strain so true strain in width direction to the true strain in thickness direction so this width direction we can write it as ln w not w not by w f and in the thickness direction it is written as l not t not by t f right <coughs> okay now practically it has seen that it is very difficult to measure this thickness variation and it creates more uh, errors while calculating the thickness strain so to remove that uh, probability of the error we can just convert this thickness strain 
in terms of this width and the elongation that is the length strain that is the axial strain right because this axial is a very uh, long term it's higher term so the thickness measurement will be somewhat uh, sorry the length measurement will be better so better result will be there so how can we convert this t naught by tf into width and this uh, length right so we assume that the volume of this region remains conserved so the initial volume will be <coughs> initial thickness initial width and initial length will be equal to t final wf and lf right so we need to find this t naught by tf so t naught by tf will be equal to wf by lf by w naught and naught right so the formula will change to plastic strain will be equal to ln w naught by wf ln wf lf by w naught l naught right so we'll just write it so this ln so this w naught and wf so that i have written over here initially l naught equal to l naught so lf equal to 1.2 l because 20 percent elongation is there then w naught equal to w naught so wf will be equal to 0.9 w naught because 10 percent decrease is there right so w naught by wf so it will be 1 divided by 0 0.9 ln wf will be 0.9 and lf equal to 1.2 right so now if you do the calculation so you can use the calculator so it will be let me use this ln 0.9 ln 0.9 into 1.2 369 <clears throat> so it comes around 1 1.37 okay so this is the ratio right <clears throat> so basically it decides that so from here you can say that the uh, strain in the width direction is more as compared to the strain in the thickness direction right so basically that means uh, this is resistant to thinning if this ratio comes below one right so that means the strain in the thickness direction will be more so that that sheet is more more prone to thinning okay so by this we can say if this ps is greater than one so that means resistant to thinning right because the strain in width direction is greater than the strain in the thickness direction and ps is less than one that means it is not resistant to thinning okay so not resistant to thinning so okay guys so hope this will help you for your preparation so thank you.